Hi, my name is David Hicks. Thank you for looking at this video. We're going to talk about today, why does God allow natural disasters and plagues? It is March 24th of 2020. At the beginning of this month, which now seems like eons ago, here in the state of Tennessee, uh, we were hit by uh, some very strong, very severe tornadoes. Um, 25 people at minimum died. Uh, the this, this storm stretched, and I'm, I'm checking my stats just to make sure I got this right. It says the destruction spanned 50 miles across four counties. People lost their businesses. People lost their homes. People lost lives. I went to a volunteer to help with the cleanup on one Saturday morning. It was the first time I ever felt like I was in... Uh, a war zone after the battle had ended and there was no more fighting because you could see all the destruction that had taken place uh, entire buildings garages just level and so it's you know it, it, people's lives have been torn apart by this and so now right on top of that we have the coronavirus COVID-19 it has changed the world in a way no other virus has ever done. The world has reacted in a way that has you know, never been seen before. And uh, I was looking at this a couple of days ago. I was looking at the statistics at uh, worldometer.org, I believe it is. I'll check here just uh, at www.worldometers.info forward slash coronavirus to give credit where credit is due as far as where these statistics come from. Two days ago, March 22nd, there were 317,300 confirmed coronavirus cases, 13,642 deaths. Two days later, on the morning of the 24th, there are now 392,812 confirmed coronavirus cases 17,235 deaths, an increase of almost 3,600 deaths, an increase of about, off the top of my head, 75,000 or so cases. So why does God, and why does God allow this? Why does God even cause these things sometimes? And let me say up front, I'm not here to tell you I know exactly why the tornadoes happened. I don't know exactly why the coronavirus is happening, okay? I can't tell you that. God hasn't come to me and said, David, this is exactly what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. What I can do is I can show you places in the Bible where similar things either happened or have been promised to happen. And what is God's reasoning behind it? What's the motivation? Perhaps the most famous plagues in the history of mankind, I've got a computer here I'm gonna, that I'm using for my notes, and I'll, I'll set that down. Uh, but perhaps the most, not, the most famous, one of the most famous, at least series of plagues, is the 10 plagues in Egypt. Um, whether you believe the Bible is actually God's word or not, most people have heard of the 10 plagues against Egypt. And having realized I need my computer now, I'll list out for you what those 10 plagues were. The wa water of the Nile River was turned to blood. In fact, water all over Egypt was turned to blood. The plague of frogs, lice, flies, death of livestock, uh, livestock boils on the skin of, of people and animals, hail, locust, darkness, and finally the death of the firstborn. So these were three ten incredibly bad plagues, uh, incredibly intense plagues. Now you might say, well, the darkness, that doesn't sound bad. Well, the darkness was such a darkness that you couldn't even, you know, it, it's like being in a cave, deep, you know, you're in a cave deep in the earth, you're not anywhere close to the opening, and you know, all the lanterns are off, everything's off. You cannot see your hand when it's right here. It's absolute darkness, darkness that could be felt, so it says in the Bible. And it demonstrated 
uh, how God was more powerful than the sun god, which I think is Ra, off the top of my head, um, R-A, the sun god in Egypt. But anyway, why did God do this? Why did God allow such you know, awful place in which many people, many Egyptians at least, died? Well, the Bible tells us that Egypt had been oppressing Israel. Um, and, and so in Exodus 3, 7, you know, God ties together, hey, I'm going to be doing this because I have seen the oppression of my people Israel. Egypt had been, uh, had enslaved the people of Israel. Now, who are the people of Israel? Well, they're descendants of um, uh, Jacob, who was the grandson of Abraham. In fact, in Genesis chapter 15, uh, God told Abraham that his descendants would be uh, enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. So for a very long period of time, the Egyptians had enslaved the Israelites and were oppressing them. In fact, if you re read Exodus chapter 1, you'll see that there was a time in which they were even killing the, the if a son was born, they would immediately, or at least the, the midwives were instructed to, uh, kill the son if the woman had a son immediately. Now, the midwives disobeyed. That's a good uh, good little story there, but you can read it in Acts chapter 1, but eventually the Egyptians took matter, matters into their own hands and um, killed the babies themselves, the baby boys. So there was incredible wickedness that was being done to the Israelites on behalf of the Egyptians. And so God says um, in Exodus three nineteen through twenty, He's doing these. He's going to do these plagues uh, to get Egypt to let Israel go. And then in Exodus chapter six, verse six and seven, uh, we read this. If I can get there. Therefore, say to the Israelites. Now this is God talking to Moses, the man whom He chose to lead the people of Israel out of out of uh, bondage and slavery. Verse 6, Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment, i.e. the plagues. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. If I had to pick a theme for the Old Testament, it is know that the Lord is God. I looked up the uh, definition of Lord. Uh, just Sometimes words, even the smallest ones that we've heard many times throughout our lives, sometimes it just helps to hear a definition. At least it does for me. So, um, Oxford has Lord as meaning a master or ruler, someone having power, authority, or influence. So God is the master. God is the ruler. And if I had to pick a theme for the Old Testament, I think I would pick that one. Because many times over, God says, I'm going to do this so that whoever will know that he is the Lord. And so he wanted the people of Israel to know that he's the ruler. He's the one that is in charge. He's the one that they are to submit to and follow. But it wasn't just the Israelites. Okay? He wanted the Egyptians to know the same thing. Not just the ones being oppressed, but the oppressors as well. Exodus chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. Now, Moses' brother Aaron, he was three years older. Um, he... Aaron would do most of the speaking. Moses uh, was very gun-shy, apparently, when it came to the speaking. Maybe he stuttered. I don't know. But God appointed Aaron to do most of the speaking on behalf of Moses. So anyway, you were to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my miraculous signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment, I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt, 
and bring the Israelites out of it. So with these plagues, these mighty acts of judgment, God was going to let the Egyptians know that he is the Lord. They worshipped all sorts of gods. He wasn't one of them. And if they were willing to open their minds to it, they would realize that he was the one that they should worship. And he was the one that they should follow when they see all the mighty acts that he does. Or at least perceive and know that the gods they're serving, they aren't as great. And, uh, they're not anything close uh, to the God of Israel, the God of, who created us all. So there are other, um, there are other verses in reference to this about why uh, God used these plagues. Um, God wanted the story of the signs he displayed to be told to Israel's descendants. He wanted these, uh, I, this, this story of how he delivered them from slavery to be told to their children and their children's children. That's Exodus 10, 1 and 2. Uh, he wanted Pharaoh to know that there was none like God in all the earth. Uh, it, he uses the word you there as he's talking to Pharaoh. So you could have been plural. Unfortunately, I hate the way English is that way. But at least Pharaoh, he wanted him to know there's no God like, uh, like him in all the earth, Exodus 9, 13. So that God's wonders would be multiplied in the land of Egypt, Exodus chapter 10, verse 9. Finally, to execute judgment on all the gods of Egypt, Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. Those are other reasons that God listed as to why uh, he was going to use these mighty acts of judgment, these ten plagues, against the Egyptians. Now, this is not the only place in the Bible where it talks about plagues and, and natural disasters. Uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 12, I'll try and get out of my own way here. It, Israel had rejected God from being their king. Instead, they wanted to have a king like everybody else around them. And that's just a red flag there when we want to be like everyone else around us. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it often is because the majority of people don't actually follow God. Um, so Israel had chosen, they had come to Samuel the prophet and said, give us a king like all the other nations around us. And, and so and Samuel tried to warn them saying, don't do this, but they persisted and insisted that they would have a king and God let them have their way. But in 1 Samuel chapter 12, God uses a, a, a mighty storm uh, to show Israel that their wickedness was great in asking for a king, that they would see and perceive that their wickedness was great in wanting an earthly king instead of God to be their king. In Joel chapter 1 through chapter 2 verse 14, Joel talks about a plague of locusts, a disastrous plague of locusts. That's, locusts was one of the plagues in, the, in Egypt, as I listed earlier. But the point of the plague was that, so that people would turn to God uh, with all their heart. Sorry, uh, some of that got, accidentally got erased when I <laughs> dropped the whiteboard after I'd written on it. Um, so that people would turn to God with all their heart. Joel chapter 1. Uh, in a similar vein, in Revelation chapter 9 verse and chapter 16, and we'll read that now, we're going to see that God is either going to bring or has already brought, or maybe a mixture of both, plagues upon mankind so that people would repent, so they'd turn from their evil and follow Him. Um, we'll start with Revelation chapter 16. Okay? Revelation chapter 16. And we'll read verse 8 through 11. All right. Thanks, Mark, for following so far down. I couldn't find you. All right. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun. This is John seeing a vision of uh, things to come. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was given power to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had control over these plagues. But they refused to repent. And glorify him. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. Men gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. So here we see two plagues one, uh, global warming, 
warming, literally, uh, apparently caused by the, the sun increasing in intensity because the angel poured out his bowl on the sun. But the bottom line is that men were scorched with intense heat, but they refused to repent. Then something happened to them and that they were in intense pain. They refused to repent. Turn back a couple of chapters to Revelation chapter 9. And I'll start at verse 13. The sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice coming from the horns of the golden altar that is before God. It said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops was 200 million. I heard their number. The horses and riders I saw in, the, in my vision looked like this. Their breastplates were fiery red, dark blue, and yellow as sulfur. The heads of the horses resembled the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. A third of mankind was killed by the th three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur that came out of their mouths. The power of the horses was in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails were like snakes, having heads with which they inflict injury. The rest of mankind that were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood. Idols that cannot see or hear or walk. They did not repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality or their thefts. So God sends severe plagues on mankind. We're talking about a third of mankind being killed, and yet mankind refuses to repent. Now let's have an honest discussion for a minute here. Again, I do not know why the coronavirus plague is happening, okay? But can we at least ask ourselves this much? Have we done things to anger God? We talk about how God is love, absolutely. But he also has a side of wrath, a side of wrath that is described as fierce, as great, not as in be great, but as in uh, large in scope and intensity is the way I think of it, great wrath in that sense. God does not hide his wrath uh, from mankind. In fact, um, in this last one, this last bullet point, God, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, Moses is talking to the people of Israel. And he first, it starts out all so wonderful and so lovely as he talks about all the blessings they would get if they followed God. But the vast majority of the chapter then is about all the horrible things, hard things, two things too graphic to even read, really, um, that would happen to them if they rebelled against God. And so one of the reasons that God would send these the plagues upon the Israelites is as punishment for their disobedience. See, especially in verse 45 and verses 58 and 61 of Deuteronomy chapter 28. And so that is often the reason for these plagues. And so we have to ask ourselves, have we angered God? Because, and, and let me say this real quick, how do you understand God being both love and God having wrath? It's because you cannot be passionate about love, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control, and just be kind of, oh, does it bother me nonchalant? about their opposites. If you love love, you're going to hate hate. If you love kindness, you're going to hate meanness. If you are passionate about self-control, you're going to hate out of being out of control. So God, as he is so passionate about love and patience and goodness and kindness and perseverance and all these wonderful qualities, things against which there is no law, as Galatians chapter 5 says, that he cannot stand the things that are directly opposed to them. They're opposites. And so here it lists out 
a whole bunch of things that people refuse to repent of. Murders, magic arts, sexual immorality, or their thefts. Now, interesting point, and maybe she needs to admit, that I've seen magic arts flagged as an alternative interpretation, drugs. So let's just talk about this for a moment here. Um, yeah, I'm doing a time check, so I'm trying not to take too much of your time. But these are some statistics I researched. All right. Well, let's look at the first one: murders. Okay, we all know there's violence in the world, and people you ever, just how often during the week on the nightly news, even locally, is it talking about somebody being killed? It's one of the reasons we don't even hardly watch news anymore because it's so depressing about. You know, and, and now we live in an age where mass shootings in schools, mass shootings at, at, at like the concert in uh, Las Vegas, um, mass shootings are almost like in vogue. You read about people taking in vehicles and just plowing into crowds. It is, it is a world gone mad, it feels like. And, and, you know, people are being murdered even in, in mass now by uh, the evil deeds of some. Um, think about abortion, okay? And you might your immediate reaction might be, well, David, abortion is not murder. Okay, let's just set that discussion aside for a minute. What does it matter? Because in Proverbs chapter 6, when Solomon lists the six, seven things that God hates, one of the things that he says is hands that shed innocent blood. Whose blood is more innocent than that of an unborn child? Call it what you want, but it's something God hates. And so, according to the statistics that I came across, but from the years 2010 to 2014, the first half of the 2010s, 56 million, it's an estimate that there was 56 million abortions Worldwide, each year, 56 million across the world each year. In 2017, according to the Guttmacher Institute, Guttmacher Institute, G-U-T-T-M-A-C-H-E-R, there were approximately 862,000 abortions performed in the U.S., 862,000 in 2017 in the U.S. So, murders. Didn't repent of that from the plagues. Um, magic arts. Well, if magic arts can be translated as drugs, now there's definitely sorcery in the world today. I've been in Africa, they practice sorcery, okay? And I'm not saying I saw people like pull rabbits out of hats. I'm talking about like placing curses upon people and just dark arts. And of course, there is witchcraft. I would I guess in every country of the world, certainly there are people who practice uh, witchcraft here and, and those kinds of things. But let's talk about if the translation here can be drugs. Well, let's talk about those for a minute. Um, according to the Center of Addiction, 18 million Americans According to the Center on Addiction, 18 million Americans, and currently there's about 327 million people in America, struggle with alcohol addiction. 4.2 million, marijuana. 1.8 million, painkillers. We're in the opioid crisis. Um, in fact, my, uh, to take my sister, who struggles with tremendous back pain, her the amount of painkillers she can get has been drastically decreased by the people who abuse painkillers. And, and by the, the effort to crack down on the opioid crisis, people like her who really, truly need the pain relief um, can't get as much as they need. The 0.8 million, cocaine. 0.4 million, heroin. Millions of people struggling with abuse of alcohol, abuse of drugs, and all the things that come with that all the destruction and the havoc that is wreaked in the lives of those around them, even those um, that they supposedly love because of alcohol abuse and, and drug abuse. Um, there's sexual immorality. 
boy, where do we go from here? Um, based on the research I did, it was I consistently saw that four percent of websites are pornographic in nature. Assuming that is true, okay. According to Google, when I re researched this a couple days ago, there are over 1.7 billion websites. 1.7 billion. If just 4% of those are pornographic in nature, and ironically, we just, uh, I just did a video re recently about um, the Sermon on the Mount, how Jesus talked about when you look at another person who wants for them, you commit adultery with them already in your heart. So we're talking about websites dedicated to make people do that which Jesus told us not to do, to encourage people to um, lust in their hearts for people who aren't their wives, aren't their husband. Um, well, if that's true, if 4% are pornographic, then well over 69.7 million websites, almost 70 million websites are pornographic in nature. Let's say the percentage just cut it in half. We're still talking about 35 million websites dedicated to porn. Um, we have, uh, homosexuality has increased exponentially, okay, and it is a, a very difficult situation to deal with, and, I, and I'll, I think I'll talk about that more in just a minute here, because I've got to chew out basically my fellow followers of Jesus for something, if I can get to it, um, but we were just um, for in, in the sexual revolution since the 60s, little just set aside homosexuality. Okay, sex between men and women who are not married, it's it's off the charts. You know, we live in a life that that says, um, you know, pursue sex at all costs. Basically, get as much sex as you can from many people you can as often as you can, because that's what you know life's about, and nothing could be farther from the truth. Um, we live in an age where sex trafficking is a huge problem. Child pornography, child abuse, sexually speaking, huge problem. I mean, child abuse is a problem anyway, but just narrowing it down to this specific discussion. And finally, he talked about their thefts. Another thing that they refuse to repent of because of their plagues. Uh, according to Cybryant.com, C-Y-B-R-I-A-N-T.com, ransomware, where people are having their computers hijacked, basically, and they have to pay money in order to get their computers unlocked. Um, in 2016, a business fell victim to ransomware every 40 seconds. It is estimated that businesses will fall prey to ransomware every 14 seconds in 2019 and 11 seconds in 2021. Global cost of ransomware is predicted to reach 11.5 billion in 2019 and 20 billion by 2021. So obviously these statistics were from just a few years ago, but still 11.5 billion, 20 billion in 2021 victims of ransomware. That's thefts. So have we given God reasons for plagues? Absolutely, absolutely. Is that why this one's going on? I don't know. But we need to ask ourselves. You know, we need to we need to repent. We need to listen to those voices in our head that are saying, hey, you need to get your life right with God. Regardless of whether or not there's a plague, regardless of why this virus is going on and why this tendency of the NATO hit and stuff like that. It's a uh, it's awful. Um, I'll try to end quickly here. There's an actual different reason why plagues happen, and it's not related to sin. This one was actually related to faithfulness. It goes back to a man named Job. Job lost, these were kind of personal plagues, if you will, because he lost all, he was a rich, rich man, richest in all the East, if I remember correctly. And uh, he lost all his livestock. Cattle, uh, let's see, sheep, donkeys. I should have read the story before I got here. This refresh my memory. But he last lost all his livestock. Even more importantly, he lost all his children in a whirlwind that hit their house while they were all gathered together, and the uh, house collapsed, killed them all. Lost all his servants, except in each incident where 
something, uh, one of these individual plagues, if you will, happened to him. One servant was left alive to be able to go tell him the bad news. And it all happened because he had been faithful to God. And Satan had challenged God, saying, you know, if you take away all this, he'll curse you to his face. And so God took away, or allowed Satan to take away, everything that Job had except for his wife, who encouraged him to curse God and die. And yet Job refused to speak evil to the Lord. In chapter 2 of Job, his health is taken away. Still doesn't curse God. And then three friends show up, and their role is to comfort Job, and instead they spend, you know, they have this long conversation asking Job, telling Job about how wicked a man he must have been for all this bad stuff to have happened to him. But in the end, God shows up. He questions Job because Job had wanted to question him, so God had to do a little humbling of Job there. And Job does humble himself before the Lord in that regard. But in the end, he blesses Job. You know, for every child he lost, one child was replaced. And for all his possessions, God doubled them. And in James chapter 5, verse 11, it, he talks about how you've heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very merciful and compassionate. And so Job, uh, when you read the whole story of Job, in the end, God pours out tons of mercy, tons of compassion on Job for his faithfulness to him. But Job did have to endure a hard time. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, please stay faithful to the Lord. And through whatever plague or problem has come your way, hold on to him, cling to him. And if you're not following him, turn to him. And uh, God bless you. God bless this recording.